Hi, I'm Megan Finnerty, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm with USA Today, and as usual, I'm here at my home in Phoenix, Arizona, to bring you Coronavirus Conversations, part of Just the Facts Live. This is a weekly show focused on how facts can fight fear and connect us using the power of our more than 5,000 journalists across the nation as part of the USA Today Network. We're here to answer your key questions and keep you informed. Our mission is here, we're here to help and not like scare you or get weird and talk over each other. Today's episode is totally focused on mental health because we just wrapped up our first month uh, for most of America, pretty restriction, pretty um, a pretty intense set of restrictions for our daily lives and our workplaces. And while we know you can't control what happens outside your home, today we're here to help you figure out how to control what's happening inside yourself and possibly inside your house, if you can get anybody in there who's with you to kind of collaborate. We have reporters and experts from across the country and the USA Today Network here to help us make sense of things today and answer your questions. And we're going to start off by introducing you to all of them. I'd like to welcome uh, Rick Jervis, our national correspondent from USA Today. Thanks for being here. We're going to talk about web-based resources for mental health with Jennifer Jolly, our Tech Life columnist and host of Tech Now for USA Today. We'll be talking about relationships and mental health with relationship expert Paul Brunson. Thanks for being on, Paul. Hi, Paul. I love that. <laughs> uh, tips for self-care and mental health safety with um, licensed marriage and family therapist Adriana, Adriana Allende. Or Allende. Alejandre, I'm so sorry. We said it right five seconds ago. And Reverend Kaylin Malazzo, she's a palliative care chaplain at NYU Langone Health. Thank you all for being here so much today. Um, we're going to start our show off with something impacting a lot of you, which is the intensity of having um, sort of full-time parenting and full-time work and full-time being inside your house and not being able to take your kids anywhere. Rick Jervis uh, worked on a story recently about stress and parenting right now during coronavirus. Rick, thanks so much for being on. Um, and I don't want to like imply anything about your kids, but tell us, I know you're a parent, tell us who you've been social distancing with inside your house these days. So inside our house, I'm actually married and we have two kids, nine-year-old L and seven-year-old Isla. And so we've been inside very close quarters for weeks now, just like a lot of other people are. So, well, thank you. I hope you say hi to them. Say thanks for, we'll thanks for being on the show today. Um, talk to us. Your story talked about how stress is impacting family life and it was definitely sobering at the top of the story. Walk us through what you learned. So basically, as, as as sort of anybody knows who has uh, kids during this 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 outbreak time, um, uh, being in such close quarters and um, and doing things like uh, distance learning, um, and and um, there's and, your family. Hi. Yeah, there they are. They're the troublemakers, and having to take care of kids dur during during this time can like stress out anybody. And um, there was a, a so like University of Michigan study done um, shortly after the the uh, outbreak began, and it showed like in the U.S. about 61% of uh, people surveyed um, basically reported shouted, yelling, and increased screaming at like children. One in six parents um, uh, basically admitted to spanking or slapping a child during this time. So the uh, the uh, thing which 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 a lot of child advocates fear. Is that this 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 change of scenery and and the increased stress might lead to increased child abuse, um, and keeping children home from school also is 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 sort of potentially like a problem because because the uh, children's biggest advocates against um, child abuse are typically parent are are like typically uh, teachers, educators, principals. Those are the ones who actually notice signs, and and take steps to actually prevent it. Um, so if, if uh, kids are home and don't, and, and don't have that, that level of advocacy, don't have an adult like on their side, could be, could be trouble. Rick, when I read that in your story, I, it felt terrible because you're thinking as an adult in your community and neighborhood, certainly I've seen neighbor kids um, out and about in their own yards right now or on walks with their family. But as you mm -hmm. pointed out, they're almost never on their own. Like they're always with their parents or because this isn't really a time when people, you, you have to watch your kids to make sure they're not touching other kids and stuff like that, so. Right, well, that's the thing. So so the kids are around the parents all the time. And, you know, for a lot of families, even for the sort of majority of parents that I'm finding talking talking to experts, that's a very positive thing and um, and leads to to stronger family bonds and a lot of, a lot of really positive things. Um, but it's also stressful. And if there are ever, 
and and if there are any kind of underlining issues, if there was a history of child abuse and child sort of neglect, then that's all going to be amplified if those same children are around their parents now under these really hard, stressful times. Rick, I appreciate that insight. Um, when you you're kind of a specific, you're a very special expert or not expert on this topic, but you have some specific insights on this topic because in a previous part of your career, you were in Baghdad as a correspondent or a bureau chief for USA Today. And you were saying that you've seen kids obviously endure incredible stresses and that you yourself have endured incredible stresses as part of your like daily work life. So I, our next question, sorry, my next question is like, give us some chat with us about that. Well, yeah, that's true. I was a, I was a sort of Baghdad bureau chief for USA Today for over two years, and um, I've also been down on the border quite a bit, Mexican border with with US, working on stories there. And I noticed when I was in Baghdad and um, talking to uh, uh, sort of migrant families that I, I've actually seen these 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 families under incredible amounts of stress on, on, under some of the most stressful, worst uh, 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 situations uh, you could ever imagine. And through it all, I kind of remember, I remember these children just still kicking around the ball, still laughing with their friends. So children are, are like really resilient. And they actually, even in some of the worst situations ever, I have seen children over and over again, just, just kind of shine through, bounce back and just be really resilient. And you saw that in some of your reporting. Thank you for that, first of all. Um, and you saw that in some of your reporting about what parents can do right now to encourage that resiliency, that it's not just anecdotal. Experts are saying kids are resilient and you mm -hmm. can encourage it. So talk to us about some of those ideas. Yeah, the thing that the experts uh, basically suggest, and I've spoken, I spoke to like a number of them. By the way, you know, almost all of them did say that the, the sort of majority of, of kids actually do fine under under these circumstances. So I don't want people reading the article and, and, and freaking out and thinking that their kids are like doomed. Like most of the kids are just going to be <laughs> fine by this. But um, the things which they recommend doing, first and foremost, the thing which, which they always recommended was self-care of the parent needs to come first. And that's extremely important. You know, the uh, parent needs to take care of themselves. They have to, there has to be, there, there should be some sort of exercise uh, sort of regime um, healthy eating, if if like possible, uh, making sure you get plenty of sleep. Those things go a long way to keeping calm in the house. Um, the other things which they recommend is is uh, basically addressing some of these issues with your kids. You know, talk about this virus to children who are old enough to like really comprehend it, um, okay. so that they're not picking up facts else. Uh, elsewhere um, and get them involved in like daily scheduling. You know, kids mm -hmm. kids, kids love to like um, plan out a day, uh, figure out what you're gonna do like the next day, get them involved, what do they wanna be involved in? Um, so as long as their attention is focused on sort of constructive things, there's less chance of, of, of sort of anxiety and other things building up. Well, I know we got to get wrapped pretty quickly, so I want to thank you. But I have one more question for you. Um, has mm -hmm. there any? Have there been any pleasant surprises for you as a parent? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's some of the things which 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 we're talking about earlier. But the uh, things which really um, surprised me is how sort of resilient my kids have also been. Like this has been a major disrupting event. They're like not going to school, but it's incredible to like see them just bounce back and 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 just sort of adapt to 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 this new normal. Um, that's been that's been really surprising and uh, really great to see. Awesome. Thank you so much for these insights. We're going to invite you to stick around so that you can be in conversation with some of our other guests. But thank you so much, Rick. We're going now to Jennifer Jolly. Um, Jennifer, as I mentioned, is a tech columnist for USA Today, but she also writes, uh, she's a freelancer. She works for the New York Times here and there and lots of other people. Jennifer, thanks for being with us today. You have some good news for us about expanded coverage for um, people who, have, who are suffering from, with mental health and anxiety right now. So let's start with the good news. Well, the good news is you're not alone. Just about <laughs> everyone out there is feeling stressed, anxious, uh, some depression, and just kind of overall crappiness right now. You're not alone if you wake up in the morning and you have a hard time getting out of bed. And that was what made me start to really research and write the column that I did on mental health and mental health resources. So first of all, 
totally normal, which is what I found out when I got online and started really seeking out some advice and some help right there at my fingertips. So um, Medicare, there were a number of recent changes to Medicare that they are now paying for seniors to get telehealth support, telehealth mental health support. But just within the last week or so, we've we've understood that if they're just doing phone support, so just talking with a therapist over the phone, Medicare might not cover that. So it's really important that they talk with a therapist via Skype, via FaceTime, Zoom, one or, uh, or within a dashboard of one of the services like Talkspace or BetterHelp, WellNight, Ableto. They have their own dashboards that will put a video call up to let you speak with a therapist one-on-one. -on -one. I did hear about that because traditionally, um, and, and that's really been a problem, is that um, the government doesn't cover phone calls, even though right now that could be all you really need. I know the other day I tried to get my parents to be on a Zoom call, and it took 20 minutes to get the whole family right. together. But I want to talk about those telehealth or those teletherapy services. Those are built to walk people through. So we, we, we're not necessarily endorsing any one of these companies as behalf of USA Today, so I do want to make that clear. Like, they're not paying for this segment, but um, in your research and in the work you've done, lots of organizations have tried to bring down barriers to people adopting these technologies. Like, so offering yeah. discounts, keep, go ahead. I haven't found a, a new app, a new, I'm, I'm not sure how long they've been around, just a few weeks, I think, but it's called Get Support. And I think it's getsupport.co, but if you just type in, you know, Google getsupport.com.co, it's a new company to teach seniors. It's seniors teaching seniors how to get on Zoom, how to get on Skype, how to use FaceTime. And it's incredible. This is amazing. It's such a good resource. But in addition to that, for mental health specifically, um, I utilize, for many of my stories, I utilize a site called Just Answer. That's one of the easiest. You type in a question and anywhere from $5 up to $50, you can get connected within a few minutes to someone who's just there to listen. And there are so many of these springing up right now. And of course, the question comes up, how do we know who's on the other end of that call? They are really vetted wherever you're looking into these, whether it's Talkspace or any of these online therapy kind of programs, they're really well vetted. And it is up to you, just like you would pick a therapist in real life, to make sure there's a connection, to make sure you feel comfortable. But there is help out there. And there's a lot of free help, too. That is so good to hear. I um, Well, because I think it is daunting and people feel isolated in their homes. And I always think about you can feel isolated physically and you can feel isolated in your own head where right? you feel like you're the only person who is thinking and feeling these things. Um, your story also talked about, you know, if you if you feel like you maybe be, if you're having more than just a down day, um, talk to us about people, you know, acute mental health resources. There are so many acute mental health resources out there. If you're feeling suicidal, there's been a lot, a huge uptick in drinking. That's a column I'm working on right now. So if you're having trouble with substance abuse, alcohol abuse, uh, right here on your screen, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, these are staffed 24-7 suicide prevention, disaster distress, uh, talk with us helpline, crisis, you can text if that feels more comfortable. And I tried all of these as as I was writing about them. And within a few seconds, you have someone on the other line who's, if not anything else, listening to you, telling you you're going to be okay, filling in that, that sense of I'm completely alone. So many of us with children, I, my youngest, our youngest is 19. She's home from college and and I love having her home. But of course, there's issues that come up in any family dynamic. My One of my best friends has four kids under the age of nine at home. You know, it. one of the things that I've yeah. realized is if I try to be really strict about a schedule or strict about anything, whether it's 10 projects I'm trying to get done because I have time all of a sudden, whatever it is, then I kind of set myself up to be disappointed. So I'm learning to roll with the punches more and just feel like, hey, there's nothing, there's no normal in normal anymore. And that has to be okay right now. Well, Jennifer, I really appreciate both your personal insights and you um, helping connect us to so many resources and especially um, resources about how to use the resources. So stick <laughs> around on our show. Um, we'll ask Thank you to like, you. Kind of participate in the chat. And now I'm going to bring up Paul Brunson. Paul is our, the host of Better With Paul and a relationship expert. And hi, Paul. Thanks for being on here. What's up, Megan? So far, so good. How are you? 
you, you know, yeah. I'm, you know, you know what I'm shocked at. I'm shocked at how I'm looking at the comments. You have a global audience. I mean, I'm seeing South Africa. What's up? I'm seeing, you know, Nigeria. What's up? It's incredible. Oh yeah. Well, USA Today. You know, not just for Americans. <laughs> I just yeah. made that up. Um, yeah. Paul, we, you were talking in our pre-show interviews about how quarantine can be good for people who are living together and in a relationship. Definitely. Tell Definitely. me on it. Tell, tell me on. how. All right. So let me hit you with this, Megan. Now, for married couples prior to COVID-19 lockdown, do you know what the average number of hours we saw each other? And I say we, right? Not that we're, we're married, Megan. Yeah, right? not you and I. Your husband. I'm thinking about my wife. You know what the average number of hours we would see each other in a given day was? Awake. Uh, oh, what, yeah, what would you think? Yeah, three. Awake. Close. Two to three hours. Okay, yeah. That's it. Two to three hours. And now we're at 24 <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All the a, time. It's a different ball game. But this is great because this gives us finally an opportunity to get to know the person that we've married and maybe we've been married to for 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. um, the beauty here is that this gives us an opportunity to learn how to better communicate with each other, right? Learn how to become better listeners. This gives us an opportunity to reconnect right? So many of us spend a lot of time with each other early on in our marriage, but perhaps mm -hmm. as we got busy in work, we, we split apart a little bit. So this gives us an opportunity to reconnect. And, and a lot of people will not like me saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway, is this gives us an opportunity. This is a defining moment to determine, is this really a good partner for us? Maybe it's not. Maybe yeah. our partner's not stepping up, right? Maybe we realize that, you know what? Our partner actually is a terrible person to be around. <laughs> and now I no longer want to be around this person. I think that's okay. I think this is a defining moment for relationships. And if it turns out that you don't want to be in the relationship, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's actually a good thing. Go on and, and you know, live a better life. Yeah, when you're allowed to leave your home. Feel, no, I'm kidding. Um, yeah. You know, though, I was thinking about this, that so often when marriages are tested, there are gender norms that are already embedded in that in that in that narrative. Like I had a baby a couple months ago. It was fine. My husband's incredible. But like everyone who's had brought a child into the world knows like it's going to test your marriage. Like things happen. Right. But there are prescribed uh, gender norms for how he should behave and what's expected of me. But in this instance right now, like people really get to make up their own playbook. So I totally hear you when you're like relationships can make or break right now. Like, yeah, there's not like a ton of gender norms around. Like, how do you cohabit for 24 hours a day in a quarantine? No, no. And, and, and it takes strong communication mm -hmm. to be able to establish what those norms are for your relationship. And well, so, so then wait real quick. Tell me then what are your tips? I know you have a couple to say, like, here's what you do do if you want to make it work. Yeah. I mean, the number one thing is to listen. Like we don't listen, you know, people just don't listen. What I mean by this is that it's very important for us to hear out, right? Who the other person is. And when mm -hmm. I say listen, this is I'm talking about essentially not just come up, have, have an automatic response, but then there's these two, right? You want to let yeah. You want to you want you want to limit exposure to the news, and I'm sorry, USA Today. I love you, right? I love you, but yeah. I'm taking it personally. Yeah, you 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 want to limit because a lot of it is is just is all you know death and gloom. Secondly, is the joint schedule. It's very important that you know if you're going to binge watch uh, uh, Tiger King all night long, you can't get up at 1 p.m. when your partner's got you know woke up at 9 a.m. Right? You want to make sure that you're up roughly at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, then you also want to make sure that you're doing something together, making something together. My wife and I will make dinner together. We're actually creating art. What this does is, you know, whenever you're doing something together, it's a great bonding activity. Uh, so these are some quick tips to be able to stay, you know, stay together. And the last but not least, definitely give each other space, right? Okay. You can't, this is what I say is that, you know what? You can't have your partner, right, on top of you 24 seven, even if you're in a small flat, we're, we're in a small flat here in London right now. It's important to give each other space to say, you know what? For the next two hours, I'm going to go into the room or I'm going to go into the bathroom, <laughs> wherever you want to go. Right give each other some space. So you had some good, I, I appreciate that. That is true. I think people are very grateful for their yards right now if they've got them. Um, you were mentioning though, that this has really changed the game for people dating who are living apart. So talk yeah. to us, you said there's effort, understanding, all this stuff, like talk to us about how dating has changed through coronavirus. 
Yeah, this is what I find to be wild. Imagine if you had finally found someone who you thought could be your wife, your husband, you started dating, and then COVID-19 lockdowns hit, and now you're, yeah. right? Think about that. What do you do? What do you do? I think the beauty is, is this, is that you can now test creativity through date nights, right? And what yeah. I mean by date nights is that this is a time to see if that other person wants to put effort into the relationship. I've seen some beautiful stories where people have had food delivered to the person they're dating, right? And they have the same ingredients delivered to themselves. They get onto Zoom and they cook together, right? Or you'll have a bottle of wine delivered to your partner. You'll come together, you'll have a drink together. This is a great opportunity to test effort. And I'll tell you this, if you are dating someone and they're putting in no effort, they're just jumping on like, hey, what's, what's, what's up? What's good, oh. right? There, 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 there's no effort in their communication with you. That shows you that person is probably not ready for a full-time in-person relationship with you. So I think this is a great time for those who are dating long distance. And then, you know, for those who are, um, <laughs> for, for those who are uh, actually, you know, dating in the relationship, mm -hmm. this is a great time because you get a chance to do the date nights together. You get a chance to do the activities like cook together. Mm -hmm. And then also uh, love language is incredibly important. There's a book, Dr. Gary Chapman. Wrote. I love it. I know it. Yeah. Yeah. You know it. Yeah. Yeah. It, I think it saved my marriage. Everyone gives love in a certain way, receives love in a certain way. This is my ask for everyone watching this. If you are living with someone you love, Make sure you don't leave this lockdown without knowing their love love language. language. Yes. So if you're not familiar with love languages, you guys, I don't want to be a weirdo, but like it's the kind of book like you can grab, you can buy it, you can skim it. It's it boils down to right uh, acts of service, um, words of affirmation, there you go. Uh, gifts, gifts. There you go. Uh, time spent together. And yes. yes. What? what Physical touch, physical touch. <laughs> Sorry, this is a game show now. Um, and so those are the five love languages, which we're not endorsing the book either. We're not like selling you anything on the show, but it can really help if you know what your partner likes, because it's not always, we don't all like the same things in our marriages. And if you're always making one effort, right, to, to show them love, but they really want this other effort, that's how we have disharmony. Um, so I am going to, Paul, I'm going to ask you to stay on um, because I know we have some other, we have some people who want to chat with us real quick. Um, Jennifer, you were mentioning that um, you've started doing a date night with your spouse. So talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I have worked from home with my spouse. We are both freelancers for the entire time we've been together. And when you live together, you work together 24 seven, as Paul was mentioning, you can, you know, the romance can go out pretty quickly. So we try to get out, go for a walk, hold hands, talk about things other than work, other than stress. But also this has been great advice for my friends. I mentioned my friend who has the four kids under the age of nine. We go for social distancing runs up in the hills. I live in Oakland, California. We go out to the trails, out to the hills, far, far away from everybody. We stay six feet away. And then we have, we call it, trail therapy like we are each other's therapist and one of the things that i recommended to her was hey take that 20 minutes take that 45 minutes go on a date with your spouse so it isn't all about work it isn't all about school it isn't all about stress and just in the week or so they've been doing that it's really really helped i don't know paul if that's good advice or not but it's really helping and just even a video call with my family or friends has helped my mental health so so much yeah I love it. I love it. <laughs> date nights. And I mean, really, and, and why not date your spouse and why not do it as, oh, right. as possible? I love it. I really yeah. appreciate that, Jennifer and Paul, because it is inspiring. I know, you know, that's really the point of today's show is like, I think a lot of us were sort of white knuckling through the first month and we can't keep that up right? If we're going to keep social distancing and we're going to stay in our houses and we're going to try to keep each other safe. We've got to have a plan for how to stay well and not like feel like every day is like a so stressful. So stay with us, both of you, Paul and Jennifer. Thank you for being on. Um, I'm bringing up our next guest. I'm so excited to have her because we've got questions about self-care with Adriana Alejandre. Adriana, how are you? Hey, morning. I think <laughs> I'm good. No, we're both we're both East, we're both Pacific time. So okay. um, Adriana is a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I wanted to start out by talking to you uh, practically. Um, I'm where do people start if they're just stressed out? If you're stressed out, recognize it and be kind to yourself. 
So important um, because oftentimes our negative thoughts overpower us and we just speak so negatively and unkindly to ourselves. So try to be aware of your self-talk and reverse it. And, you know, along with that, know that broken isn't bad. So this is a temporary part, this feeling of feeling broken. Um, it, it, that's actually an illusion. You are not broken. It's a part that needs current attention and it'll be temporary but you need to tend to it and not ignore it and the last part is to know that everyone else is also overwhelmed and this is the number one thing that i've been hearing from so many people that has been very helpful and a lot of people feel very guilty saying that uh, that they're glad that they're not alone but uh, the reason for that is we tend to feel like we're targeted when we're isolated in pain or in struggle. But with this global quarantine, it's everybody. Everybody is absolutely overwhelmed and going through various different struggles. So recognizing and relating the ability to relate to others is also important um, if we start to notice that we're feeling, we're starting to feel down. So bringing up the facts, evidence can help us a long way. I really appreciate the thoughtfulness. I One of the biggest questions we're getting right now is around money stress, that we know there are more than 17 million Americans who filed for unemployment. Uh, and, th and that's just sort of like what we can see, right? That the number of people who've lost some amount of their income is much, much higher than that. And also we know money is classically, even in the best circumstances, something couples and individuals feel a lot of anxiety around. So how can you help us like think through that? Yeah, money stress, I think, even before this quarantine or global pandemic, really, it's been an issue. And it, it relates so much to our mental health. Money and mental health can never be separated. So learning um, what to do during this time for our own sanity regarding money is going to be crucial. Um, I think research is really important during this time and knowing when and how to ask for help. So if there are people around you that have means to help, it's... Um, not always bad to ask for that kind of help and it could be minimal um, but in terms of the research going online and seeing what kind of programs there are because a lot of counties are offering uh, assistance there's a lot of people donating as well so there's a lot of grants and sometimes loans definitely loans available right now nationally so um, looking up uh, what kind of assistance is available. But in terms of our own self, money brings up anxiety for us. And it makes us think about the past and the future. So anxiety is rarely about the present. So being able to learn skills to reorient us and ground us into the present moment is powerful for our own, you know, being in the moment. Because living in the past, living in the future, catastrophizing thoughts and creating hypothetical worst case scenarios isn't helpful or healthy for us. It's very toxic and that's what we're doing to our own selves. Stay in the present moment and you know, for the time being, survive this moment. You aren't surviving for 10 years from now, you're surviving for the right now. So learn and ask for the things that you need for just this current moment. And if you are not struggling in this current moment, then try to reorient yourself from the future and bring yourself to this current moment. Create your present safety. I'm like trying to do that right now while I'm listening. To no, that, thank you for that. that. Because sincerely, that's like very, that's very helpful because it's so actionable. And what I also hear you saying is like, just make it small, right? Like when we think about the past and the future, we make things very big when we say it's just today. Um, I also am just commenting that one of my, I have a couple of friends who've had to file for unemployment in Arizona. And I felt so thankful that they told me that because then I was able to start thinking about how I could care for them a little differently. Like mm -hmm. I possibly wouldn't give them cash right now because that would seem a little bit awkward among friends, but I definitely was like, oh, we should like make them some food and bring it over to their house or check in a little more regularly to whatever you can do, right? You know what I mean? Um, anyway, I, I think that's a really like helpful thing because I also hear you saying like, let other people know about your money stress, like ask for help and try to get it. But our, another question we've heard a lot about is people are like, well, how can I make my, how can I fix myself? Like how does, does self therapy exist? And you said, no. <laughs> self therapy, uh, 
No, but self-help does. Yes. So. so talk to us about some of that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Because we like to reserve the word therapy for mental health professionals, right? But it is still possible for you to do self-help even outside of therapy. So the, some best practices for um, this type of healing is to write something that you're grateful for, whether it's about yourself or externally about someone else or something else. You can create a happy playlist, whether that's songs, poems, art pieces, but just a playlist of things. Uh, it could be slideshow or audio format of things that you enjoy. Take a walk. So with the precautions that are currently in place, given the, the global climate right now, uh, you know, six feet apart, masks on, um, but it's still possible. I actually created a post a little bit ago um, about the benefits of the sun. So if you're able to open your windows, even though depression within us tells us, no, no, stay in one place, stay in the dark, um, try to go against that and open those blinds, open the windows, open the doors, let some fresh air and let some sun rays in because there are a lot of mental health benefits um, that come from the sun. And you know, finding five things, five beautiful things in your routine on a day-to-day -day basis can go a really long way and touches upon gratefulness as well. And of course, allowing yourself to feel and accept, accepting the circumstances as difficult as it is. It's also something that isn't changing. It isn't going anywhere. So how can we learn to accept our current dynamic? What can we do in the moment to make it a little bit better? And um, feeling, even though it's it could be very uncomfortable to have uh, what we may consider negative emotions. It's healthy for us. It, if we try to push away all these negative emotions um, that are uncomfortable to our minds and our bodies, what we're actually doing is we're prolonging them. They're actually going to stay longer because we are not dealing with them. Oh my gosh, this is all so intense. I really appreciate um, your thoughtfulness here. Uh, so do some of our other um, our other participants. I want to bring up Rick Jervis. Um, Rick has a question for you. Um, he wants to talk, or he wants to add to your self care ideas. Adriana, this has been this has been this has been great. I loved I loved all your self care points. Um, thanks so much for that. I wanted to add one, um, and it's you sort of hit on it on like take a walk, but but sort of one thing, and this is more geared towards families, I guess. But one thing which we're starting to do now is that every morning right after breakfast, me and both of my daughters take a bike ride and it's like a quick one. It's like it's like a, a, a sort of bike ride around the block a couple times. We uh, we walk the dog as well. We knock that out. It's maybe 15, 20 minutes. And afterwards, we've knocked out two very important things. We got family bonding time and morning exercise all like at the same time. And the rest of the day just feels brighter and better. And so doing something early in the morning, I, I uh, think like that really helps throughout the day. I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah, that's Thank great. You. Thank you so much for that, Rick. I appreciate it. Um, I, I did the same thing. I got out with, I have a five month old, so he's not walking, but we got out first thing this morning and uh, did a couple miles through the neighborhood. Um, Adriana, I want to kind of close with a, something personal to me and, and possibly for many of our viewers. Right now, a lot of us are coping with anxieties by doubling down on a few behaviors that I, I want you to be able to speak to. Um, first of all, people are, there's no separation between work and home. So some people are working a lot more or they're feeling busy about work, whether or not it's like high quality work, who knows. Um, and people are consuming a ton of news. Again, and I'm not saying like stop, but this news right now is pretty intense for us. So yes. can you talk to us about how we can sort of self-care if people are dealing with anxiety by like hyper-engagement? Yeah, great question. And I'm going to start with actually my last point that we had spoken about. So uh, reducing news consumption is really important actually, um, but first being aware as to how much it, we are consuming and what kind. So is it through um, reading or audio? Are we listening and or watching? Uh, so verifying what our methods of news consumption is first important because then from that you analyze, okay, how much of each? am I intaking and how is it impacting? How many, you know, out of a hundred percent, how much do I think about news? 
um, and you fill out your pie chart, right? You could color it in. And if it is, you know, past, I would say even 40%, I think that's a lot. And, you know, for you to try to minimize that bit by bit, um, it could go, you can go day by day or week by week is really helpful. Uh, for your own mental health, but also take a day off. So I know some people like to work a lot. And um, I think, you know, using some of your sick days for mental health days has been something many of my clients and friends have been able to use. So mm -hmm. obviously check in with your policy HR as to what's allowed. But Either way, just um, organize your day so that you have a little bit more structure and pause mm -hmm. moments throughout your days, moments where you can um, replenish, nourish yourself, just take a break. You can structure your, your day a little bit differently. And just because we are home seven days a week does not mean that we get to work those 24 hours or even those whole seven days. Continue sticking to your required um, work schedule and do not go over uh, because that you know it, it's just easier when we're at home but it doesn't make it healthy for us find other ways to enjoy time with yourself and with your mind and with your thoughts and the last one is to give permission to say no so whether this is for other members in the home or other work um, delegations that come through it, it, saying no or rejecting um, request is helpful for us because uh, I know many people struggle with this. I get a lot of my clients that tell me that they just don't know how to say no um, or they don't know how to say it with certain people. So practicing that in front of a mirror and having a template. So if you're, you um, work via email a lot, then just copying and pasting it. So learning to rephrase the word no can also be helpful um, as long as it's not in a passive format. I, I hear that. I mean, I, I'm, I work for people and I also manage people and I'm always happy to hear someone say like, it's unrealistic for me to get that done today. Like I, yeah. you know, I don't take it personally. I just need to know, oh, what is realistic or what might work? Also, my husband and I made a rule that um, we can't bring our phones into our bedroom anymore. <laughs> like you got to be on Instagram or you got to be on their phone outside in the house. But our right. time there is like for bed and for talking. Yes. And not not consumption of text messages or or whatever it is we're doing. Um, yeah. Adriana, thank you so much for your time today and for being on the show. I will ask you to stay with us again a little bit, but now we're going to um, we're going to close our show on a slightly different note. Um, we are we feel really grateful to have Kaylin Malazzo. She's a palliative care chaplain at NYU Langone Health in New York City, and they have several floors dedicated to only coronavirus treatment. And um, so you're really on the front lines right now. Uh, first, tell us a little bit, not everyone knows what a chaplain does. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. Um, so a chaplain in my context is someone who works in a hospital um, to attend to the spiritual and the emotional needs of our patients, um, the, the patient's families, and our staff members. Um, and that is regardless of whether they belong to a faith tradition or not. Um, but we recognize that all people have emotional needs. Um, so that's in a nutshell what chaplains do. Thank you so much for that. So um, I, before we get into your section, we have some specific questions for you, but I did want to ask you, you know, um, how are you doing your job right now? Like, how are things going? Yeah, I mean, things are going okay. We're busy here in the hospital. Um, it's intense. Um, but we're, we're managing uh, the sense of camaraderie um, and teamwork amongst the colleagues um, is something that has just exceeded what I've ever seen in a hospital before. Um, we feel supported by the community and we're all working together to, to get through this the best we can. So we're okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for that. We um, got so many of us are praying and thinking for you, of you and sending you our best thoughts and good vibes, depending on people's religious ideas. Um, yeah. I do want to ask you specifically, this section, this show is on mental health and so much of your job is helping to comfort people who are afraid of what's happening next because mm -hmm. we are not in control of our health, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. And right now, so many of our viewers and, and me, myself, we feel pretty out of control about what might happen next in our lives or our financial yeah. futures. How do you comfort those of us who feel this way? Yeah, I mean, I think that the question of control is interesting, and I think it's normal to be afraid of what we don't have control over. 
Um, and in this crisis, it's made us very aware of how precarious and how fragile um, our institutions are, our society is, and also how we are as humans. Um, so it's normal to be afraid, but I think it's important to remember that there are some things that we do have control over. Um, so many people, when this first started, who were fortunate enough to be able to prepare physically for this. So they set up working at home, they gathered supplies. Um, and in the same way as that preparation took place, I think that we can prepare um, emotionally and spiritually uh, for loss and for what is to come for many of us. Um, I think we've all experienced loss already, certainly financial, social loss, maybe even death, physical loss. Um, and if you haven't yet, I think it's realistic um, to acknowledge that for many of us, we will lose someone who we love or no people close to us will lose someone that they love. Um, and I think that that is maybe not on the surface a comforting thought. I mean, it's not a comforting thought, but I think the comfort comes um, from knowing that when we acknowledge that, um, what we have, what we experience is anticipatory grief. Um, and grief is not just an emotion, it's a skill, and it's something that we can get better at. And it's something that um, prepares, anticipatory grief can prepare our hearts and our minds um, for loss and for what's to come. Um, Talk to me for a second. Um, anticipatory grief might not be an idea that everyone on our interviewership understands or maybe has had experience with. Yeah. So you said grief happens along a continuum and mm -hmm. that we can kind of make a story about it. Um, mm -hmm. and so walk us through those ideas of anticipatory grief and then grief is a process. Yeah, so anticipatory grief really begins when death or loss comes up on the horizon for us. So when we, when we see that it's coming for ourselves or for a loved one in a very real way, because we all know we'll all eventually die someday. But in situations like this, it's bringing that um, reality a lot closer for a lot of people. Um, so the feelings that come along with that fear, um, uh, sadness, anxiety, um, that is what I mean when I say anticipatory grief. Um, and what I've been hearing when I'm talking to a lot of people who have lost someone um, during this crisis from COVID-19 is that um, it feels very sudden and it feels very traumatic because people who were otherwise healthy not too long ago um, are unfortunately dying. And so um, it sort of interrupts the story of our lives and the story that we have for ourselves. Um, and it can feel very traumatic um, and very sudden. So when you asked about a continuum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, we're gonna kind of wrap here, but you had some really interesting advice about turning it into a story. Mm -hmm. um, and so something I'll acknowledge in my other life, you guys, I'm a professional storytelling consultant and coach. And what we know about, and I'm sure you do too, Kaylin, is when we're in crisis and in the moment right now, it's very hard to make sense of things. It's actually very hard to tell a story about what something means because you're actively experiencing the grief or the trauma or the loss or the disruption of yeah. your normal life. And I think what you were talking about earlier is that like you can look forward though to this making sense in the future that like you will be able to tell a story that can help frame the meaning of this moment. And it's like, it's okay if you can't do it right now. Yeah, it is, it is. Um, I, you know, we live our lives through stories and we experience, we create meaning through the stories that we tell. Um, and what I hear from people who have experienced something traumatic or sudden is that like, my world is turned upside down or my reality has been shattered. Um, and the way to begin um, to incorporate that story into the story of our lives is just to start, you can do this in your head, but I think it really helps to do it with a trusted loved one, just to start talking about and processing what happened. So I'll often ask people, what was life like before you saw any signs of this illness? And then what were the first signs? What happened when you first had to come to the hospital? Like, where were you when they called and told you the bad news? And, and these things help to build out context and help people to make sense of the story of what happened um, to themselves and to their loved ones. Um, and when you can frame that narrative, you can take the first steps into creating meaning. And um, like you said, that, you know, that doesn't happen right away. It's a process. Um, but, but starting that in the beginning is important. 
Kaylin, I think that um, I really appreciate that insight. I think we deal with this all the time at Storytellers. People are always um, call often to tell stories about things that are incredibly upsetting and, and what happened. And that's something we've been working on is that exact thing to say, it's okay to be in the middle. You're at the beginning of your story right now. Absolutely. And to accept that and to know that. And um, it doesn't make anything better. But I yeah. think it lets us off the hook for be like, it feels very disempowering and frightening to say like, I don't know what this means to right. who I am or to the story of my family or blah, blah, blah. And I think if you let people know, you couldn't possibly, like no one can. No. Give yourself a minute. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, um, of, of course. And we're all in this together, as other people said, and we're all trying to figure out, you know, meaning and meaning's not something hiding under a bush that you have to search for and will pop up on you. It's something that you create as you live your life and you tell your stories. Um, and you allow yourself to really experience and be present um, with what's happening to you. Um, so yeah, it's a process. Well, thank you so much for being on with us today. I really appreciate that. And I think that's a really powerful note to wrap on. Thank you. Um, with that, I'd um, love to bring up our all of our guests today. Um, and thank you all so much for being on the show. Um, we appreciate all of your help um, in helping us make sense of these moments, um, trying to figure out sort of like <sighs> how to be stronger and better and more together in our second month um, as we move forward as a community. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks guys for being on. Um, thank you so much for watching and joining USA Today. You can follow along with our coverage all the time on usatoday.com. You can stay in touch with us right here on Facebook at facebook.usatoday.com. And we always appreciate you checking out our Instagram or anything else. Uh, good luck for this next month. We'll see you. Uh, we'll see you here every Tuesday. Have a good one.